Hello and good morning. Welcome to Study the Word. This program is sponsored every week by the Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at 948 South Geyer Road, right there in Kirkwood. Now, folks, we have that website up there for you to look at. Jot that down because you can go there to find our times of services and our location if you're not familiar with the area. But there's something else I want to stress with that website because it pertains to some Bible questions that we received this past week. Sometimes, you know, we, we get some new viewers who stumble upon us for the first time and they have Bible questions. Well, what they don't know is that some of the questions they've asked, we dealt with on this program just a few weeks ago. Of course, we have regular viewers, and so we don't want to be doing the same questions every week. But that means we also don't want to ignore those who have those questions and are looking for answers. Now, if you go to that website, folks, type that in, www.kirkwoodcoc.org. And when that first page comes up, you're going to see a number of different icons there, and one of them looks like a television. It has like that old-fashioned rabbit ears on there. So if you click on that, if you click on those rabbit ears, it'll take you to another page, and it's going to talk about our TV programs, our past TV programs. And there's like four lines, and you have to read them, um, it's smaller print. But you're going to see on the fourth line, it has in blue, and it's underlined, archives. If you click on that, it'll take you to all our past TV programs. And you can scan through those programs that you have missed. And the reason I bring that up because we received a question this week of what are the 144,000 that you read about in the book of Revelation? Well, we spent a whole program on that. And so I want to encourage not only that person, uh, but others to go to our website that you see there and then click on that TV icon and then click on the word archives and it'll take you right to all our past TV programs and you can scan through all those Bible questions and you can learn the Bible answers to them. Now that doesn't mean we don't deal with repeat questions. We do. I mean sometimes we have people who have asked a question that we dealt with maybe a couple of years ago. And so, or they ask it a different way, which is what we're going to be dealing with today because a person called in last week and wanted to know, how did Sunday become the seventh day, the Sabbath? Well, it didn't, and we're going to talk about that in just a few moments, so we hope you'll stay tuned as we deal with this week's Bible question. Now, at the end of our program, we're going to put a phone number up. It's that phone number you see right now. And we're going to offer a number of free Bible study helps. But the reason we put it up now is that you know that this program deals with Bible questions. And if you have one, we'd love to hear from you. We'll use it on this TV program. And uh, so jot that number down. We'll put that number up at the end of the program. Leave it up for much longer. You'll have time to even walk out of the room and find a pen and paper and come back. That number will still be there. And so we hope to hear from you. But we need to go ahead and get into our program today. That was a long introduction. Okay. So once in a while, we will get a question. And I can tell that a person has missed or has um, not been aware of our weekly program where we have discussed some important principles that would help with other questions. How many times, if you're a regular viewer, have you heard me tell you that one of the biggest problems we have in the religious realm of clearing up confusion is people not understanding the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament? And today's question relates to that. I think, I, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but man, maybe 25% of our questions relate to that. People have different questions that can be cleared up quickly if they just know that when Jesus Christ came, he brought the gospel. I don't want to, again, do another program on that, but you can go to the website and see some of our past programs that deal with the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you don't understand that, you're going to be confused, and you're going to have a lot of questions that can be answered, of course, 
But when Jesus came, he did away with the old law. That old law was for the Jews, Israel. And Jesus brought a new covenant that was for all people, Jews and Gentiles. You read about that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 20. Excuse me, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, and the list goes on and on. Colossians 2, verse 14, Jesus nailing the old law to the cross. And if you read Hebrews chapters 8 and 9, you see clearly where it talked about when Jesus died, then his law, the gospel, came into effect because where there is a testament, you need a death, you need a death of a testator. That's what the Hebrew writer was talking about. So a lot was accomplished with Jesus dying on the cross. Now that was a lot and it relates to a lot of things we've talked about in the past, but I, I want to deal with this question of how, where a person says, well, how did Sunday get to be the seventh day, the Sabbath? Well, well, it didn't. It didn't. Um, there was the Sabbath, which was um, the seventh day of the week was the Sabbath, and that's what Israel of old kept, and they were commanded to keep that. Let, let me go ahead and stress that. Um, if you have your Bibles or a pen handy, you can jot it down and read it later again, but I'm going to be reading from Exodus, Old Testament, of course. because We're going to see where this law did exist, doesn't exist today. Um, and Sunday did not replace the Sabbath. It's not called the Sabbath. On Sunday, it's called the first day of the week. But a person might say, well, but it's Sunday. It's talking about a sun god. Well, man came up with that term Sunday. There's no question. We don't worship a sun god today. It's just a term. Just like Saturday. Um, derived from the planet Saturn. And it relates to a god. Um, Saturday. But... Um, Again, that Saturday is referring to, under the Old Testament, the Sabbath. All right, so let's not get hung up on those words of the week, you know, Monday, Tuesday, all the way through Sunday. We will notice specifically what the Bible teaches about the Sabbath and how that Sunday did not become the New Testament Sabbath. Not at all. And that's just dangerous thinking for a lot of reasons. In Exodus chapter 31, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also, also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Wow, that was it's quite the law that was given back under the old law. And they were to keep the Sabbath and the reasons for it. And so some people seem to think that well, when Christianity came on the scene, when Jesus came on the scene and he died. Now, not just when Jesus came on the scene, because as we have dealt with in other programs, people can say, Chuck, well, Jesus kept the Sabbath. Well, of course Jesus kept the Sabbath. Jesus lived and died while living under the old law. When Jesus died, then we under a New Testament. That's clear. Now, when Christians observe the first day of the week and the responsibilities of worship, it's not the new Sabbath. You can't take those Sabbath laws and now turn them into the uh, first day of the week laws and call it the new Sabbath. That's just wrong on, on a lot of levels. And so what are we going to tell people today if, if they don't worship God on the first day of the week that we're going to put them to death? Well, no. But we are warned, though, Christians, um, getting a little ahead of myself, I'll back up here in a moment, but since we've been talking about consequences under the old law of breaking the Sabbath, working, 
how that they would be put to death. But we also notice in the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, when it talked about in verse 24, he said, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaken the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Will there be people who will forsake the assembly? Yes. Will they be sinning? Yes. Will we physically put them to death? No. But we know when we sin, we need to repent. Um, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. And so you can make that comparison under the Sabbath, the Saturday, Old Testament. When they violated the law, they were to be put to death. Now, when people sin today, the church doesn't put anybody to death. As Christians, we don't put anybody to death. But when they bring sin upon themselves, the consequence is a spiritual death. And death is just a separation. Now, people need to be reunited. They need to come back to the Lord. And that's accomplished through obeying God, repenting, confessing the sins, and making things right with the Lord. Okay, so let me just back up now a little bit and, and talk a little bit more about the fact that you know, we have the first day of the week. Why do we gather on the first day of the week? We have to go to the Bible. You know, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by his authority. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, God has spoken unto us in these last days by his Son. So, can we go to the New Testament and, and learn? Is that really Jesus' words? Don't I have to run out and get a Bible that has red lettering in it that I can just read the words of Jesus? No, you don't have to do that. You see, when the Apostle Paul was preaching, he told the brethren at Galatia, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 12, that when he was speaking, he was speaking by revelation of Jesus Christ. Those words were not his, they were inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so we can go here and we can read what did the Christians do in the first century. This inspired word will give us the guidance that we need. This is what we have to go by. So having said that, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Acts chapter 20. Now, again, this is after Jesus has died. He has gone back to heaven. He shed his blood. Remember in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, when he was talking about his death, he says, this is the New Testament in my blood. There's a New Testament coming. There's a, there's a new law that we would be under that would be for all people. No more distinction between Jew and Gentile. Not at all. And so after Jesus dies and goes back to heaven and Christians, people are becoming Christians and they're coming together as a church to worship. That's what you do. You come together. First um, Corinthians 11, verse 17 and 18, you come together as a church. So what happened here in Acts chapter 20? Well, we find that Paul stayed with the brethren there over um, a Sunday. People say, I don't want to say Sunday. Okay, first day of the week. Um, just because I say Sunday doesn't mean I'm worshiping a sun god. Okay, because you say Saturday doesn't mean you're worshiping Saturn. Okay, and there's just other terms that are just that are being used. Um, months, months of the year, um, based on some gods. And, and but when you say that month, you're not saying that you're worshiping some pagan god. Back on track. Acts 20 and verse 7. It says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. And so what I'm noticing and what we notice here is that the Christians were coming together on the first day of the week. So what do we call that first day of the week? Well, do we call it the new Sabbath? No, we're not going to call it the new Sabbath. 
We're not under the Sabbath. And that was on Saturday. That was on the seventh day. This is the first day of the week. Not on, not on Saturday. And people, of course, you'll have religious groups today who say, well, we need to keep the Sabbath. Well, no, you, you shouldn't keep the Sabbath because, well, there's consequences to that. And we're going to read a very important passage in just a few moments. Hope you get pen and paper handy and you can jot that down. Remember, this program, if you don't have a pen and, pa pa excuse me, pen and paper handy, we're going to upload this program. This program will be on that website, putting that website up again. It'll be on that website, and you can go back and, and watch it as many times as you want and then have your pen and paper handy and jot down some of these passages that we're talking about. Um, okay, let's go to another passage that makes reference to this because Christians are to remember the Lord's death. They, they come together every first day of the week to remember the Lord's death. In Acts 20 and verse 7, they did that. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they, they're going to continue to do to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we're going to do this every first day of the week. We had a program on that too about the Lord's Supper. Not something you do once a month or once a year. Not at all. Okay, over in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter is where I'm going now. We're going to read the, the first two verses where it reads, and listen carefully to what Paul writes to the brethren here at Corinth. It's a church. That's Christ. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. So this wasn't going to be a command just for the brethren at Corinth. This is why we read it today. You know, yeah, we're reading somebody else's mail. This was a letter written to the church at Corinth. But you can read like at the end of the book of Colossians that they were told, look, when you're finished reading this, give it to the church at Thessalonica, and then you read the letter that we wrote to the church at Thessalonica. Why would you exchange mail? Because they are inspired letters. And if this church was told to do certain things, then that would be the same for all. We'd have these things in common. Now, this, this is the problem when people say one church is good as another. Well, if one church is as good as another, then everybody's doing the same thing, practicing the same thing, teaching the same thing. We know they don't, but they're supposed to. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, the brethren were told to speak the same thing. No division, perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. And the only way you're going to achieve that is if you get back to the Word, study the Word, which is what this program is all about. We want to study the Word of God. We don't want to add or take away from it. So these brethren here in 1 Corinthians, chapter 16, verse 1, Paul is going to tell them something that he, that he has given orders to the other churches of Galatia, we haven't read verse 2 yet. Look at verse 2. On the first day of the week, let, it, let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. One of the acts of worship is giving. We read about that over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, how that we are to give cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. And we don't give grudgingly. We willingly want to give back to the Lord and, and use the funds for what he has designated. That's another lesson, of course. Can't take the money out of the Lord's treasury and do whatever we want with it. There have been guidelines that have been given, but let's stay on, on track here. So where did this concept of the first day of the week even come from? Well, Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week and we find that Christians are commanded to remember the Lord's death. Jesus commissioned that, of course, he gave that in um, Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. The night of his betrayal, you know, here he was, he says, you know, this is the bread, take, eat, this is my body. Well, Jesus hadn't died yet. He said, this is my blood, you know, the fruit of the vine, take it, drink of it, in remembrance of me. And that very passage, that very passage in Matthew 26, verses 26, 27, and 28 was quoted by Paul to the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Read verse 23, 24, and 25. 
Why is Paul quoting that? Because he's telling the brother, this is what I delivered to you, uh, that you are to remember the death of Jesus. Now, our time's getting away. <clears throat> so I need to get over to this passage over in the book of Colossians, right? Because people are going to say, well, isn't it the new Sabbath, the first day of the week? Well, well no, it's not. And well, what about the people who say, well, you got to keep the Sabbath? And true worshipers today worship on the Sabbath, on Saturday. They don't worship on Sunday. Well, did Paul have to deal with that in the first century? Don't you think that there would be some people in the first century that would have struggled with this? I mean, you, you've got people that are converted out of Judaism. Don't you think they would be bringing doctrines from Judaism and trying to bind them on Christians? Of course, you read it over and over again. Read Galatians chapter 5 and verses 1 through 4. You find these, these Jewish Christians are saying, you know, we need to practice circumcision. If you don't practice circumcision, you're not a Christian. And Paul had to say, if you bind circumcision on people, you have separated yourself from Jesus. You can't bring laws over and bind them on people today. Well, don't you think that there would have been these Jewish Christians who were saying, you know, we, maybe we should be keeping the Sabbath. Okay, well, let's read about it. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul had to deal with this issue. We'll pick it up in verse 11. Colossians 2, verse 11. He says, in him, talking about Jesus, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hand by putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Well, what's he talking about? Well, symbolically, he's talking about baptism, which is the next verse. Buried with him in baptism. So you've cut yourself now off from the world. That's the concept of circumcision, a cutting off. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Old law is gone. But let's read on. Now, when you say something like that, that's going to stir up some questions. Paul anticipated that. Verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them. Now, verse 16, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or in regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Don't let anyone judge you in food. You ever have anybody tell you, you can't eat certain foods? Well, yeah, they're getting that from the Old Testament. Paul says, don't let anybody do that because there are no unclean foods today. And then he said, don't let anybody judge you on the Sabbath. You think anybody's going to judge you, on, judge you on the Sabbath? Of course, people are doing it today. And so let's make sure we understand clearly, folks, the dangers of not, if, if you don't understand the difference in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I hope we can be a help to you because we have a six lesson home Bible study course that deals specifically with that. First couple of lessons. There's only six. It doesn't take long to go through them. But those first six lessons, those six lessons open up your eyes to a lot of false ideas that are out there. And you see exactly what the Word of God has to say. But in order to know that, you have to study the Word. And so we'll send that free Bible lesson to you, first lesson. We'll mail it out to you first thing tomorrow. Work at it at your own speed, but send it back. We'll look it over. We'll return it to you so you can hold on to it for future reference along with your next lesson. And um, we hope that you'll feel comfortable enough to do that. We don't want any funds. We're not soliciting funds. We don't want donations. What do we want? We want people to learn the Word of God. That's why we're here. And we as Christians, members of the Kirkwood Church of Christ, we want to do all that we can to help people to become familiar with the Word of God. Clear up the confusions, which is why we've been offering every week. Now, I've been used to do it maybe once a month, but I'm doing it every week now. Along with the correspondence course, we're offering the, fr the two free pamphlets that people have been requesting. 40 things that people think are in the Bible, they're not. People read those 40 things and say, well, Chuck, I have been taught those things are in the Bible for years. Yeah, but there's no biblical support. 
And then we have the other pamphlet that's 30 things that people say, no, that's not in the Bible, but it really is. And people read those things and they go, man, I've been told for years that's not in the Bible and there's the verses that prove it. Yeah. And so when you request the correspondence course, say, go ahead and pop in those two free pamphlets and I'll be glad to do that for you. Also, you know, because we want people to continue to learn, people say, can you put me on the mailing list for your free weekly bulletin? It's just like two articles, two short sermons on paper, um, one piece of paper folded in half, and we can put you on the mailing list for that. And there's no charge, no charge for those uh, bulletins that we mail out every two weeks. It just adds to your knowledge, folks. That's what we're trying to do here, get people familiar with the word of truth, because Jesus said it's the truth that will set you free. Ignorance won't work with the Lord. You can't stand before him someday in judgment and say, well, I didn't know. No, that's why you need to know, but you have to put forth the effort. You have to seek it. Only those who seek will find Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, and that's a promise that he gave. Okay, now having talked about the correspondence course, having, having talked about the pamphlets and the weekly bulletin, perhaps you're like some people who say, Chuck, I would just soon have a face-to-face -face Bible study now. We have classes that we set up throughout the week that fits into the schedule of you, our viewers, people who want to learn. Sometimes after work, middle of the day, in the mornings, weekend, evening. Um, a time that fits into your schedule and a place that you're comfortable with. You want to meet at the church building, say on the 2 o'clock on, on a Monday or something. Just as an example, because we have a number of classes throughout the week at the building, sometimes in people's homes, sometimes at a coffee shop. And if you're comfortable with any one of those and you would like to have a Bible study, and invite friends. If you're a lady, I'll bring my wife. We won't make it uncomfortable for you. If you want a face-to-face -face Bible study, don't hesitate. You call that number and say, give me a call. I'd like to have a personal Bible study. But call or text now your name and your address. I stress that because oftentimes people get so excited. You know, I've had people text me and that text that number and say, yes, please send me the course. And I'm thinking, okay, who are you? Uh, what's your name? Uh, what's your address? And so if you'll be glad, if you'll be um, so nice to do that, we'll be glad to help you out. Well, time's winding down, putting that website back up for you to look at. Because not only for past programs, but folks, look at our times of services. Look at our directions and come and see us. We've had people who've been watching the TV program. Um, a couple of folks showed up last week who said they've been watching the TV program and just wanted to come out and visit. Boy, that warmed our hearts. Come and visit with us. We'd love to have you. We meet this morning, 930 on Sundays for a Bible study, 1020 for worship, and in the afternoon at 5 and a midweek Bible study on Wednesdays at 7. Come and be with us. You'd be our honored guest. We hope you'll be back next week. You know what we're going to do. We're going to open up our Bibles. We're going to study the Word and answer a Bible question. Thank you and have yourselves a great day.